Now Peter Brabeck from IBM will answer the question how to build an API-based 21st century government. Peter, stage yes. is yours. Hello. Uh, yes, I'm from IBM despite my outfit. Yeah. So usually I'm expecting something with a suit and everything. Now we're in t-shirt. So you see IBM changed at least <laughs> what we wear here. So. Uh, yeah, so I've been invited to talk a little bit about uh, gov uh, government APIs and what's on here. So as you know, oops, this should be. Uh, so when you when you look at uh, today's um, governments and when you look at uh, your experience with governments, everybody expects that government changes. Yeah, so. At least I'm, I'm from Austria, I'm uh, running the European uh, API management uh, story. And uh, this European API management story, when I'm visiting the countries, so there every citizen and I myself expect that governments behave like a normal entity, like a normal enterprise. This means that you can communicate with them, that they give you a response, that you don't have to go to different, uh, uh, that you don't have to go to different places and ask for the different things. So that you have a mobile interface to governments and all of these things really uh, is set by our demanding efforts that you go to an external country that you are served when you are changing uh, your location that you automatically get all this uh, necessary approvals for your cars that you are getting and this is a real a workflow by the government has to really adopt their thinking, but also that uh, the governments needs to really express a willingness to serve the people uh, instead of uh, seeing being seen as uh, a, 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 an entity where you really have to go and pledge for service. And based on that, this is a mentality change. But based on that, this is also a change in how you are acting, so in the technology change. And the European Union published here an environment so where they said, okay, we are publishing here a guideline from the European Union that we are giving you an action plan. So an action plan, they published two action plans. One says from 2015 and one has been published now 2016, in which, which you can read, uh, so I have in included here the links, where they said, okay, every country itself must have the services uh, to be accessible. What does it mean? That you are able from every mobile phone, that you are interacting from the governments, uh, that you really can be personal, personalized this experience, where you can interact. And now when you are looking at this uh, governments and uh, European Union said by 2020. So 2020 is next year. I don't expect as everything with the European Union that we will be there, but at least there is an idea to have it. And what does it mean that, uh, that you can have it? So what does it mean in reality? So if I'm an Austrian citizen, I have a local ID in Austria. So now I'm booking something yeah, on booking.com, yeah, so, but booking.com is a Dutch uh, company. So my ID in Austria, they don't know it. Yeah, so security, so uh, the security which, which I have in Austria, so I'm an identified citizen, I'm really uh, seen as a trusted citizen in Austria, this concept doesn't work across Europe. So there are th still things to do on the way uh, when we say, okay, services need to be accessible. Services must be fast and error-free. 
So in reality, if I'm going here now on, let's take this sample from booking.com and I'm putting my social ID there, they will just ignore it. Yeah? So they will tell me, okay, please provide your email address. I will send you an email address. Then you click on the link. And once you have applied for the link and I've verified your email address is a real one, then you are allowed to book on booking.com. So, but still they don't have a guarantee that I'm a person, a, a real person. So uh, all of these personal experiences, really this is an idea which we have to uh, change our mindset. So when we look at it, so mobile provides the opportunity to deliver, deliver these personalized services. So one common thing in all of these uh, ideas is that you have a mobile phone. And this is one of the things where you really can be identified as a person because it has all these uh, uh, requirements where you have a mobile phone, a physical appliance, where you have an ID, so you're logging in with your email address or whatever, and then you have a third thing which identifies you, it's your fingerprint or your face or whatever, yeah, your mobile phone supports. So this means that with these mobile services, we are actually on the first step how you can interact uh, with your governments, how you, we can interact and identify you as a mobile, as a person. So now how can you really bring this to the community? So one way and one way of doing it is uh, through APIs. So API is a way how you can extract all of these identities from your mobile phone. And then what is behind it? Yeah, so because every mobile phone, if you're using it on an iPhone, it looks different than on an Android. Uh, and an iPhone 12 looks different than uh, Android uh, versions. So you, nearly, you really need an abstraction layer in between. So, and APIs are ways to abstract information from the content. So this means that now with this uh, methodology, with the guidelines, with the action plan, you have a political idea how to do it. And with APIs, you have a functional uh, integration how you do it. Okay, so, so on the central side you have the government APIs. So the government APIs are the services which the governments publish. So Touch Tax Office is publishing something, the Austrian Social Insurance is publishing something. If you're looking at the uh, uh, Nordics, yeah, so they also have something which is uh, published, but uh, they are not compatible. So this means that now you have private entities which are picking the, up these APIs, yeah? so you have private organizations and which give you an assurance. Yeah? So I discussed uh, yesterday with, the, with some people here, so open banking, yeah? it's a simple thing, yeah? open banking, and you say, okay, I'm a trusted entity, so I'm providing you an application and, but who is actually behind this application? Who is the person who takes responsibility? So I'm transferring money from one country to another. So now I'm going to my bank and I know my bank takes responsibility. But now if I'm in an open space and somebody can act as a third party provider, as a TPP, somebody can use just an API. So he goes on a on the portal, he goes on the portal, he subscribes, he gives you an email address, but does it mean in reality anything? So you need behind agency systems which takes responsibility, which really defines and identifies you as a person, which knows, okay, you are a physical person, you are not an organization, so these are the things which we really need in such a sharing government, in such a uh, approach. And when we now have this on the center side, the government APIs, 
which are trusted, which are open, which are secured, because security means that they are physically secured, that nobody can access at them, but it also means that they are logically, logically secured. Logically securing means they have identified you as a person, they have to be identified as the real application accessing these uh, uh, government APIs. So, and then they are consumed by either public entities, but they also can be uh, accessed via government agent agencies, via other government agencies. Means that if you are paying a fine, you are speeding in one of the countries, now you are showing your passport, you are showing your driver's license, uh, but now instead of showing it in, as a physical uh, paper or as a card, yeah, so you always can show it as a mobile phone entity, which means now you have your access, you can identify yourself by finger fingerprint, the police now can really pick up all this information and can say, okay, automatically, they will say in, in, in the European Union, if I'm speeding here in, uh, in the Netherlands, so they automatically can identify me as an Austrian citizen. So these are the ideas behind uh, exposing governmental services. So, and when we are doing that, so we also have to identify and provide the analytics data. Yeah? So we have to know who is accessing, from where is he is accessing it, uh, what's the response time. So these are all the data which uh, really need to be done, which need to be identified. And then also the social networking has to be kept in, yeah? because uh, there, there are in, I, I'm pretty sure here in the, in the Netherlands and everywhere else, there are a lot of discussions uh, when you are doing, uh, you are going on a social network and, and you are doing spamming and all of these things. But if you are really have an identity, you have a European identity, all of these true names discussions are really gone. Because then you have an identity, then you are identified, and these are the services which a government will provide based on the European Union Action Plan. So, at the reality, when we are doing that, and I'm, uh, as I said, so I'm traveling around in Europe and talking to government entities, at the end of the day, what I'm identifying is really uh, what, is, what is preventing this. Preventing them, it means that you have the workforce, yeah, which sits there, so they are government, uh, government entities, so they are employed by the government, they have history. History means they have history in terms of IT resources, they have this history in terms of mindset. So this means that now we have to change really the way of doing things, but it also means that you have to change the way how and who is doing the things. So that you introduce the open communities, that you introduce third parties, which really can access your APIs. So when we look at this picture, so one is the API as such, which enables the, the technology, which is the technology to enable this distributed uh, economy, which is enables to it, en which enables distributed uh, value creation, which really enables to work with third parties that they are providing here the the services. Then you have on the other side where you say, okay, I have the users, I have the citizens, which have a demand. So there are. The demand drives really the requirements, but also you have co-creators, which means that you now have a really proud community which can now develop based on your APIs, which are replacing and which adding to your internal workforce, which means that now you have a much broader uh, entity which can deliver such services. And then you have on the right side, where you can then really transform 
the business and where you can say, okay, now I'm feeling here, instead of uh, being a government entity, I'm behaving like here as a enterprise which delivers services, which deliver uh, user experiences, uh, and which help to epification the society, which really delivers the value based on the APIs which the government publishes. So when we look at this, uh, really the European Union published here this study, the APIs for government development study, and say, okay, what should we do? What is the invest? Which resources? What is the strategic uh, uh, story behind it? And uh, they also have some samples, yeah, so if you look at this study, yeah, so I will not uh, go into details, but look at it, there are good samples with action plans, with the return of investment cases, where you then can see, okay, what for a government, what, how does it help to really serve the citizen at the end? So. Uh, in Denmark, yeah, so we have uh, this European Digital Government Study where you can really find these uh, samples. Uh, I also found a good sample here of the Amsterdam City Data API where you have 350 million requests a year. So it always usually starts with an open data approach. Yeah, so with an open data approach where you say, okay, I have a map of the city of Amsterdam, and this map of city of Amsterdam is being accessed via an API and just delivered to my mobile phone. So this always is a, a kind of a approach where you say, okay, how can I use my my, my batch uh, environment, so how can I use to deliver data to a mobile phone? This is open data. But then when you move into more uh, higher sophisticated or higher value chain applications, you are moving actually from an open data approach, so like here the city data, that you're moving really to a, a, an event approach, where you say, okay, I'm now passing by the Rijksmuseum, uh, I have time, yeah, so I will get delivered automatically uh, what is, uh, which new uh, exhibitions are in the Rijksmuseum. And then you automatically can connect and get a ticket. So these are ideas which are behind such a uh, social government insurance uh, government where you say, okay, I'm now introducing all this e-government environments into my normal social life. So, <laughs> so at the end of the day, you will get a picture from an architectural uh, perspective like this. Yeah? So this is uh, one, once we worked with this uh, government, where you say on the left side you have the siloed solutions, and on the right side, you are really introducing here a user interface where you see, okay, the data validation, where you have an identity, a central identity, and uh, these are basically the APIs which are sitting on top of your traditional environments. So in, in Austria, we currently, is a use case which I personally like, yeah, so because <laughs> I want to use it on my own. So on my mobile phone we have in Austria, we have a, an app which this app provides you manual registration before your trip. So if I'm going to a country where I'm a little bit broader, yeah, so if I'm uh, going for a two-day trip here to Amsterdam, I don't register, but if I'm going on a three weeks vacation to Namibia, I'm going registering my uh, ID and then I get all this information, yeah, so where is the embassy and where is everything. Uh, and in case of an emergency, I'm automatically getting a push notification. But still, I have to register everything on my own. So instead of registering on your own, what you can do, you can have a, an API which gives you the service, and when you are booking the travel, yeah, so you are going to a travel agency, you're booking the travel, they are calling the API and make the registration basically based on the API. 
So these are ideas which are behind that because then they, you have your electronic ID because when you are going to a travel agency, you have to show your passport, you have to show everything. So they identify you already. Yeah? So this means these are ideas where such open governments really make sense and where you can introduce uh, an open government based on API. Well, here a good use case uh, which we have uh, from Prague. And uh, basically, uh, these are all built uh, on APIs. And when you are doing APIs, there's always two things. Yeah? And when we look on the hindering factors, why we don't have it at the moment. When you have these APIs, there are basically two things. One is the API itself. So the API is a technical exp exp uh, exposure of your legacy system. Yeah? So in this case, register my trap in a database. So this is easy. But the real thing and why we don't have it at the moment is really the interoperability because when you are calling this API, it is different whether you are registering the service in Austria, you are registering it here. It looks different, it needs different input parameters, it has different naming conventions. It's a security issue. So how do, as I explained before, how do I identify a foreign citizen? So it's really the infrastructure, the regulations, and as long as we don't have it, we really are not able to benefit of this wonderful technology of an API. So this means API economy means define the API, make the infrastructure, make the API itself, but then you need a proper management to, and proper legislation to really introduce you uh, to an API in full e-government e economy. So this ends my presentation, uh, so thank you for your attention.